I get it. I get it that you don't got it, but you want to get it, so you got it, and that's good. You know, get it, got it, good. After all, if you don't got it, you want it, and you want it, then you want to get it. Doesn't that make sense? So I understand people, you know, doing these massive numbers of altar calls. You know, last week there was a revival meeting, so they went to the revival meeting and they went running forward, you know, to get it again. And then the next week there was a huge salvation message given at some auditorium, so they wanted to make sure that they got it, so they did it again. You know, and then they kind of felt convicted about something that was going wrong in their life, so they went to another meeting, and over there, too, they did it again. Because to get it, they wanted to make sure that they got it so that they were good. Well, I don't know about you, but I think something's wrong here. <laughs> Maybe you don't get it, and that's why you don't got it. You see, part of the development of a person is called growing. You know, we we learn things and then we apply them. And as we learn them, we discover that maybe we didn't know something and as we know something, we then are able to make it a part of our life. You know, kind of like when you first stuck your finger in the fire, you know, you figured out, "Oh, so that's what hot is." <laughs> didn't take a genius to figure that one out, did it? Well, Sometimes Christians get a little carried away about trying to make things easy on you that they forget what the reality of the point of it all is and how you're supposed to really kind of like discover for yourself a little bit at a time who you are, what you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. Because if you're like most people, you're really not all that, you know, religious, you know, you're you're kind of like anti-religion because you've seen all these kind of wacko things on television and you're probably anti-religion because you've seen all these holy things on television and maybe you've seen just some weird things in your own personal life. I mean, I have. I've seen people like, you know, barking like dogs on the ground and went, well, I'm not a dog. I've seen people like, you know, jumping up and down, you know, kind of like stomping around and I said, well, I'm not a jumper and stomper and jumping all around. I've seen people like, oh so reverent that you know you go into these giant cathedrals and you hear these organs and you think somebody died is God dead here? you know I mean I've seen a lot of things that I went ooh eewee not me <laughs> you know and it took me a while to kind of figure all that stuff out because while those people that were kind of like in that giant you know organ place you know they liked organs you know I figured that out after a while it's kind of like Oh, they like that. Okay, I get it. You know, and those people that were kind of like, you know, carried away and, you know, like barking, well, maybe they kind of like got carried away, you know. That's why they're barking, because <laughs> they're carried away. You know, and those people over there that were kind of like, you know, romping and stomping and chomping and jumping and dumping, you know, doing all that kind of weird gyrations and observations, well, okay, cut down on the caffeine and the power drinks. Put them back in their place. <laughs> Because, really, that's not what salvation is. Salvation is just simply, you know, like, you were drowning, and now you're not. That's pretty simple. Makes sense to me. You know, like you were out in the ocean, you know, and you're swimming along, you know, and suddenly you go, ooh, riptide, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And you started, you know, like going down for the third time, and you stuck your hand up, and you said, where is that lifeguard? <laughs> Well, suddenly, when you went down for the last time, you know, and swallowed some salt water, that lifeguard showed up, <laughs> you know, and kind of like dragged your butt to the shore, you know, and you kind of like choking and, you know, like gagging and kind of just glad to be alive and trying to suck in some oxygen, you know, to realize that, hey, you didn't die. Well, that's kind of what salvation really is. It's kind of like preventing you from going someplace you don't want to go in order to get someplace you want to go. And you may not know that you want to go there, but that's what Jesus came to kind of talk about, was, look, here's the reason why you live and move and have your being. Here's why you are alive and what's going to happen when you die. 
And so Jesus, quite frankly, said, look, not only can I explain to you about what's going to happen after you die, I can explain to you why these things happen, and I can also give you an assurance that in this life you could enjoy it more than what you're doing now because you're letting everything around you affect you. Well, I got something better for you. And that's kind of why Christians get a little confused with this gospel thing. You know, they try to tell you good news, you know, and God's got a plan for your life. You know, God's got a you know, specific thing for you to do. You know, God needs your hands and your feet. You know, and if you're like me, you kind of went, well, what did somebody do? Cut off his hands and feet? Oh, you mean God can't do this without me? You mean God needs me? <laughs> You know, so all those messages were kind of like, you know, a little weird, you know, but you kind of went along with it in order to, you know, get it, got it, and be good about it, you know. So you went forward and you got it, you know, and you kind of got your little Bible and token Bible studies and stuff. But you really didn't feel much like being, you know, who all these other people say you should be. Well, Jesus understood that. You see, Jesus said, hey, you know, people come to me for lots of reasons. He said they come to me because they want to see miracles. So... They come and they get saved, you know, and then they, they get their miracle and then they go off on their way, you know. And he says, that's the way they are, you know. He says, they might not stick with it. And they might not be saved from the day they meet me face to face. And I ask them, what do they do with what I've given them? Oh, yeah. See, God gave them something and he wants something in return for it. Jesus said, I'm giving you salvation, but I'm going to ask you for something in return. Oh, you mean it's like an exchange? Yeah, it's kind of like you're exchanging your way of life for his way of life. And he's going to give you a chance to explain what you did with it. That's the bottom line of what salvation is, because he wants you to do something with your life. Oh, well now let me think about that for a minute. Go ahead. That's what it boils down to. Because that's really what the gospel is. The good news is that you don't get to just go along with the flow, you know, thinking that everything is like you know, and then suddenly you go rushing along, you know, and suddenly, you know, going with the flow, you go off this really giant waterfall, you know, that kills you. <laughs> because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing and this life ended for you and then suddenly you kind of like had a wake-up call death <laughs> and suddenly you went w w wait a minute I'm not dead I'm not like I'm having some kind of out-of-body experience and you went but my body's I kind of know that it's not here, it's back there. And somehow you know that it's not quite what you thought it was going to be. And that's kind of what death does to you. It's kind of like a massive wake-up call that you go, uh-oh, I think I made a mistake. I might not have quite figured this one out the way I thought I did. And that's why Jesus came bluntly and was resurrected from the dead so that you would not only know that he knew what he was talking about, as some kind of like, you know, oh, religious leader, but you would know because he came back from the dead that he does have and he is the Son of God. He has been and always has been with the Father, God, and that he has a message to communicate to us from his Father. And so when you read that part that's in red, you know, you got these Bibles, you know, that have this little part that's in red, that's Jesus explaining to you what he wants done because like he said I'll give you salvation you give me relationship you give me your you know kind of like uh, freedom and I'll give you my uh, kind of like uh, freedom and we'll see which one you like better if you like doing your own thing I'll let you go do your own thing and we'll see how that works out for you you know, you reap what you sow, you get what you pay for, you know, you, you do your own thing, you get to suffer the consequences of it now, before you get to heaven, before you have to deal with me. But I'll let you do that. So you can go out there and, you know, by my grace that I'm giving you, you know, you can go experiment a little bit, you know, and see how it works out for you. And so a lot of 
quite a apparently to other people they look like hypocrites but a lot of christians will you know get saved they'll go out there and they'll experiment with just how far can they get away with some and the truth is they don't get away with nothing <laughs> They suffer the consequences immediately. No longer are they happy, and they know it. No longer are they joyful, and they know it. No longer are they like, you know, like enjoying their life, and they know it. But they're kind of like beating up on people, or, you know, stomping on, chomping on, and, you know, acting like a bunch of, you know, kind of weirdos. And they know it. And quite frankly, so do you. So, you know, you look around and you can learn a lot from kind of what you see, you know, with people because people will kind of reveal themselves to you, you know, when you're especially reading about what Jesus said about people. You, know, you kind of understand it a little better, you know, that you don't have to go that way. You know, I mean, quite frankly, you know, I see people, you know, that I remember when I was working on the job, you know, there's some people I knew that, you know, they'd love to just like, you know, they'd smoke and they'd talk, you know, and they'd just get stoned, you know. And I watched them, and I listened to them, and I thought, you know, I don't have to get stoned to figure out that's probably the stupidest thing I ever saw. You know, and I watched them try to work, and I watched them try to run heavy equipment, and I watched them try to operate from thousands of feet in the air, you know, operating welding equipment. And I said, you know what, I don't want to work with those kind of people. And thank God I didn't have to because safety precautions provided for me to not have to worry about that because when they got quite a, quite bluntly inspected for their safety operating procedures, they were fired because they were getting stoned on the job. And to put it bluntly, I was kind of glad. And that's kind of what it's like in life, you know. We all have to stand before Jesus. and. All of us are going to kind of give an accounting for what we went out and experimented with, you know, like, hey, I want to see if this is really, you know, if it works for me, how good it is or how bad it is for me. And then we come back and we either say to Jesus, well, Lord, forgive me because you were right and I was wrong. That wasn't really that good for me and I don't really want to do it anymore. And so if you do it in this life now, that's kind of what we call getting your actions together, getting your life together, having a abundant life, because you don't get involved in some of the stupid things that people do. You know, kind of like, you don't go running out, you know, play marbles on the freeway like we used to say as little kids, you know, in order to find out whether a car is going to run you over. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go and, you know, investigate everything on Google to find out what's good for you and what's bad for you. Really, bluntly, when you sat down and you talked to God about it, you know, he kind of kind of says, well, you know, I'm going to tell you what you should do. I'm not telling you what you have to do. I'm telling you what you should do. And that's kind of what that, you know, John 3.16 was all about that you heard of. You, you know, you've heard it before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. It doesn't say they would not. It says they should not. Because, you see, John 3.16 isn't enough by itself, really, for anyone to get saved. It just simply says that God loved the world, that he did something about it. But he also says that a person should not perish. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, when someone tells me that there's a fire in the building, I usually look around to see if there's smoke. If I can smell smoke, if I can see that there's smoke, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, billowing and filling the room, first thing I do is I drop to my knees because, first of all, the oxygen, you know, <laughs> gets consumed when you're standing up. So you go down low and you kind of scoot along the floor and try to head out the door or window, and you get away from the fire. It's kind of what salvation's all about, you know. If you're smart enough, you know, you could be exiting, you know, your life, so to speak, by fear of God, if you want to, you know, fear of fire, of Oh no, I don't want to go to hell or I don't want to go to Lake of Fire. So you kinda of, you kinda of like, you know, look for the smoke and you see, ooh, you know, there's some bad things out there. I don't want that. So you, you choose because of fear. But you know there's another way that they said that you you could choose out of choice. You know, you could make a choice now that you looked at somebody and you said, Man, you know, I've seen that person over there and they seem to have it all together, you know, and they never really talk much about God or anything, and they really don't talk about their church, and they don't even talk about God or Jesus. Matter of fact, most 
of the time they just seem to be keeping to themselves and kind of happy and kind of like doing their own thing. And then I saw one time, you know, when, you know, like they got bad news, it's like they just kind of like, you know, let it slip a little bit that they were a Christian because I heard them say something like, praise the Lord. And, huh. No surprising, you know. I, I would have thought that they would have been like wanting to tell the whole world about it, you know. Instead, they were just pretty quiet and kind of, kind of tender and sensitive, you know, kind of mellow and peaceful. You know, I, I kind of like that part. Now, if I could get that without all the other junk, maybe, maybe I could go for that. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. You see, Jesus kind of understood more about us than we understand about ourselves. We think we need to energize up, you know, give me an energy drink and kick me out the door and let me go running as fast as I can and as hard as I can for everything I can get my hands on, you know, to accomplish all that I want to do. And, you know, as long as you're running in that hamster cage, you know, and you're cooking along, you feel pretty good about it till the energy drink wears off and then you go, it's time for another energy drink. Well, Jesus said to a woman who was kind of like going through that kind of rat race type of existence that if you really knew who he was, who Jesus is, that people talk about, you wouldn't need to keep restocking energy drinks. You would have, as it were, inside yourself, kind of like a constant source of energy that you'd never wear out. As a matter of fact, that'd probably carry you through life and through death into something bigger and better than you ever imagined was going to happen in your life. And that's really what the gospel is. It's not about just being saved from hell and, oh, I barely made it there. Whew. You know, just get me there by the skin of my teeth and I'll be happy. By the fingernails that I'm clutching and clinging on to God. Well, that's really not what God intended for you. You see, God really wanted you to be his example of what enjoying life was about. He wanted you to prove that there is such a thing as love among the brethren. He wanted you to demonstrate by not running forward at these altar calls, but by being confident of your own salvation to the point of having the ability to hear him speak, to see him work in your life, to know him in a personal and intimate way. And that's kind of what Jesus did when he was talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. You see, whenever Jesus was talking to someone personally, he would say, follow me. And they'd get up and they'd do whatever they were doing. They'd follow him for a while. They'd want to see what he said was what he lived. They wanted to see if he walked the walk and talked the talk. They wanted to see the reality of who he was. If he really was this Messiah, the Son of God, if he really had some something that was important practically that they could put into their day-to-day -day existence. And as he did that, those people that he spoke to and said, follow me, they did it. And the amazing thing is, they lived. And they were willing to even to die for that relationship they had with Jesus by following him constantly for about three years. Imagine that. They didn't know him that long, but they were willing to die for him. That's what it means to be saved or become part of this salvation experience, is that you get to know Jesus. You get to learn about him. You get to follow him. You get to discover that as you get more knowledgeable about him, then you see what he can do in your life. You begin to realize that it's not about some altar call that you've made 20 times, 40 times, or every time you sin you felt like you had to, oh my God, I need to go get saved again. That's really not what it's about. It's not salvation. It might get you saved eventually, but you should not perish, according to God so loved the world. But there's something else that Jesus said. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. That's what salvation is, knowing Jesus. 
Later on in some of the Gospels and some of the Bible that you read about, Jesus said, eternal life is this, that they should know me and know he who sent me. So, Jesus tried to define it by saying, look, you can put all your good examples out there of how you need to confess your sins or how you need to get your act together or how you need to live righteous or you know give up this you know don't chew don't smoke and don't go with those that do or whatever it is but you know it's really about knowing Jesus because people that know Jesus aren't perfect God doesn't call perfect people they aren't like perfectly righteous, they still stumble and fumble and sometimes they even make big mistakes, you know. But when they know Jesus, they know what to do about their mistakes. They know what to do with their problems. They know where to go for answers. They know who to talk to to get that peace that we talked about. The peace that passes all understanding. And that is why Jesus wasn't ashamed to call them his disciples because they came to him with questions now yeah the church is supposed to you know like teach you these things and yeah the church is supposed to go out there and you know like do evangelism and do all the things that you see kind of weird you know like organs and romping and stomping and chomping and you know barking and rolling around on the ground or whatever it may be they do but those are just examples of how people react to the fact of their salvation and the fact of salvation is to know Jesus and that's what the gospel is the gospel is simply getting to know God in a personal and intimate way to relate to him personally one-on-one -on -one. that's what Jesus accomplished because he said to those disciples or to those people that were religious in his day he said look you don't know who you're talking about you keep telling all the people to do all these things. You know, you got to do this and you got to do that and you do this and you do that. And then maybe God will accept you. But you'll never know him because he's holy and you're not. And Jesus said, you have no idea who you're talking about. But I will tell you who I'm talking about. And that's my Father in heaven. And he created the world. And he says, no one that comes unto me you know, would be cast out. But I would accept them if they would just call on the name of the Lord to be saved. You see, there was a big difference in the day that Jesus existed and that he came to this world in order to reveal that he exists beyond time, that he exists from beginning until the end, that he and the Father, God, are one. He came to reveal his Father and the love that God had for us so that we would always know we have someone to turn to in time of need. We have someone to turn to in time of joy. We have someone to have a personal relationship all the time in everything and in every way that we live our life. Jesus wanted us to live life, not to run from it or to hide from it or to be destroyed by it, but to actually discover eternal life that would go on beyond death, that would no longer have any hold over us and there would be no fear of dying, much less the chains that bind you when you think you're dying because you're going to be set free one way or another you're going to be set free to the condemnation of those who refused the salvation that God said he had given to the world that anyone should not perish anyone should not but they could but we could choose to not perish by discovering the reality of the message that the fact of what Jesus said is eternal life is this, that they should know me and know him who sent me. That Jesus is eternal life. And that he who has the Son has life. And he who has not the Son of God has not life. And that's how we know that we are in him. Because he loved us. Because he spoke to us. Because we hear his voice. Because we've given him the right and the privilege to do with us as he chooses. So that he would reveal himself to us as he spoke and said to those that he wanted to follow him, come and follow me.